Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current version of my Sunday sermon. This will be the last one for a couple of weeks. I have a couple of weeks vacation coming up. Actually going to go up north into Canada land and enjoy some of your beautiful wilderness. So, um, yeah, really looking forward to it. Never seen the Canadian Rockies, so... Over the last number of weeks, we've talked about the growth of the church in the New Testament in the book of Acts, and I've referred to Bart Ehrman's book, The Triumph of Christianity, a number of times. Ehrman makes a very strong case that it was miracles, or in, as in his words, miracle stories that really fueled the growth of the church in the ancient world. Um, Ehrman himself is post-Christian and skeptical about the historicity, I'll use that word, of miracles, but said that, well, miracle stories are popular and they and they grow and, and it helped grow the church. And yet he realized that at that time and place, miracles were a key reason why people at least um, paid Christians attention and considered their emerging way of life. Now, it's imagined that the plausibility matrix is reversed in our contemporary era, that if people claim miracles, then they are somehow publicly discredited. I haven't really found that to be the case, although the dynamic is complex. We live in a cultural climate that has a social construction that equates miracles with magical thinking. Some people imagine that only simple people believe in such things. Anyone who publicly admits that miracles happen loses status and respectability. Science has shown that miracles don't happen, some people believe. In my opinion, this is sort of a veneer over the culture and that, in fact, a good many, probably the vast majority of people, continue to believe um, that miraculous things happen. And they're sort of all over the map on those fronts. I think the reality is is far more complex. Christians in many ways have sort of been caught in the middle of these two dynamics, that on one hand they might be a little bit embarrassed or shy away from magical thinking in other circles, and in other opportunities and contexts they're, well, they believe in biblical miracles at least, and maybe the miracles of people that they sort of align with and disagree or agree with, and are maybe more skeptical about miracle attestations from people they disagree with. Um... Christians, of course, have a Bible with plenty of miracles in it. Christians want to speak the truth, and Christians want to present an attractive witness. And so that, in our current culture, sort of affords us a blend of credulity and skepticism, which is highly contextual and often all over the map. Christians, for the most part, depend on science and technology just like everyone else does. And there are a good many Christians that work in sectors of science and technology. And when they're trying to get a difficult program to work or construct some device or work in technology, electricity, water, any of those things, um, they might, in fact, pray for a miracle as they're trying to get something to work. But for the most part, they're going to look for um, so-called natural processes to achieve their goals in a reliable way. Now, we've last week we left Paul in Ephesus, and Paul, in fact, was going to spend at least two years there preaching in a public hall. Ephesus is the most important city and a vitally important part of the Eastern Roman Empire, and there is around him and through him a growing network of churches and leaders that are slowly emerging, and bit by bit they're figuring out their theology and they're getting their stories straight and the people are all getting on the same page. We talked about Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos and, and many, many people who are named just once or twice in, in Paul's letters and in the book of Acts. And they all seem to be buzzing about the Eastern Medit Mediterranean, comparing notes and teaching and preaching and arguing and doing all sorts of things. And bit by bit, this church is beginning to form in many of these cities uh, sometimes out of synagogues, sometimes mostly from Gentiles. Having left the synagogue, Paul spent two years teaching out of a rented hall, perhaps as something akin to a religious leader or a public intellectual. And so his message got out pretty effectively in the region, the book of Acts says. Now what happens 
later here in Acts chapter 19, is one of the most astounding miracle stories in the book of Acts. The text goes like this. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Now, of course, during Jesus' ministry, and we've seen a similar, um, a similar comment about Peter earlier in the book of Acts, now this seems to be happening through Paul. And there's a good bit of debate as actually what the nature of these, um, of these cloths were, but heal healing of illnesses and the release of evil spirits is pretty much what we saw from a lot of Jesus' miracles. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Then this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus. They were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Now, it's helpful for us to not to try as best we can to not read this with our contemporary filters, because, of course, the people in Paul's day of Ephesus had their own ideas about how the world worked, and in many ways, um, religion, technology, and even sometimes some of what the Greeks would call superstition were all alive and well. In many ways, in a very uncertain world where you had no antibiotics and um, none of the nice medical technology that we had and not all the information technology that we had, that people worked on in all sorts of ways to try to make life work. And what today we look at as religion was very much built into all of their life. And, and so when you have stories like this going out into the city, it will capture everybody's attention because people want to know, wow, how can we access the kind of spiritual power, those, those gods who are above us, who, are, who seem to have more power and more strength, how can we relate to them so that maybe some of their power or some of their... Um, some of their patronage could flow through me and resolve the kinds of problems and questions that I have. This approach is by no means isolated to that time. In fact, it's pretty much absolutely universal in human beings, even in a highly secular age like ourselves, like our own. It's often not talked about. It's often sort of lurking in the shadows, but that's pretty much the way people work. Now, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. So, in other words, this becomes sort of a wave through the city. Suddenly, Jesus and his name, Allah Paul, and the miracles and the stories, the healings and the deliverances from evil spirits, this is big news, and so everyone's excited. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came up to be 50,000 drachma. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, we shouldn't press this sentence further than it is. People, and you'll find this inside and outside the church even today very commonly, people are always get excited about a new story, about new power, and they're curious about it, and it, will very, it can very quickly become a fad. And people can get all excited about it and... Well, that, that happens for many reasons. At 9-11 in New York City, after 9-11, people who hadn't been to church for years or maybe never at all found themselves in church just out of fear. It's amazing the kinds of things that motivate people. But on the backs of these stories, people all over the region heard about Paul, heard about Jesus, and were motivated to look into it wondering, well, maybe there's some power there and maybe there's some chance there. Maybe there's something I should get in on and get into because perhaps it's a new thing that we've never really known and this will help me get an edge in life. Now, this kind of relationship is, well, it's on one hand, it's very common and very believable for us if we sort of push away the 
the public veneer of respectability around secularism that tends to uh, take keep the front of the public stage. This is this is a summary by Paul um, by J. B. Polhill, who writes a commentary on the Book of Acts. Paul's miracles had an impact on the wrong element as well as those genuinely seeking his help. Much as Simon Magus had been enamored with Philip's miracle working, a group of itinerant Jewish, Jewish exorcists had observed how Paul drove out evil spirits by invoking the name Jesus and understood to do the same themselves. In the Greco-Roman world, Jewish exorcists were held in very high esteem for the, venerable, for the venerability of their religion and the strangeness of their Hebrew incantations. Magicians and charlatans were omnipresent in the culture, offering various cures and blessings by their spells and incantations, all for financial consideration. The more exotic the incantation, the more effective it was deemed to be. A number of magical papyri from the ancient world have been discovered. Now, these would be probably more around the 3rd century, so well after this time, but it can give us a taste of the kinds of things that people were practicing. This is people looking for curing for themselves, their sons, their daughters, evil spirits in the broadest possible sense is sort of a um, the reality that that mentally, socially, someone isn't working well, or at least isn't working in condition with everyone else. These consist of various spells that are often invoked in the names in, in the names of foreign gods and employing various kinds of gibberish. In the Paris collection of magical papyri, various Old Testament terms were found, such as um, Iowa for Yahweh and Abraham and Sabaoth, terms which would have sounded exotic to Greeks and Romans. One spell reads, I adjure them, I adjure thee by Jesus, the God of the Hebrews. Another from the same papyrus reads, Hail God of Abraham, um, hail God of Isaac, hail God of Jacob, Jesus Christus, Holy Spirit, Son of the Father. And you can see people saying, well, let's, all of these things seem to work. Let's pour them all together and then maybe we'll get some of the kinds of outcomes we want from this. Ancient magicians were syncretistic and would borrow terms from any religion that sounded sufficiently strange to be deemed effective. These Jewish exorcists of Ephesus were only plying their trade. Paul's spell in Jesus' name seemed effective for him, so they gave it a try. Now, as in the Gospels, miracles draw attention. They impress, they provoke, um, often temporary interest and plausibility. Um, some people who are really drawn to miracles sort of go from one thing to another. Disciples are in awe of Jesus. Um, the disciples who are in awe of Jesus after a miracle are still found, however, to be of little faith. You'll find this pattern often in the Gospels. Crowds follow Jesus, but the crowds are fickle. And Jesus will often point out the lack of faith to his disciples and the fickleness of the crowds that follow him because he multiplies loaves and fishes and he does miracles and all of those things. And they're quite enamored by it. and They want to see it and they're interested, but that's not exactly the kind of faith and responsive faith that he's looking for. Well, it's certain that these helped grow the church, it's not suddenly the whole city changes its ways in a permanent way. It's not that suddenly the whole city is Christians and they stop um, and they immediately stop attending the pagan temples, which were magical in their own right. In fact, what we probably see are, as you would see in, in places all over the world constantly, that there are fads and waves that go in and out. But in the process, I'm sure the, the church picked up a number of people. But yet the churches would be small and struggling and continue in that way. One of the most exhaustive treatments of miracles from a conservative American um, evangelical perspective is in Craig S. Keener's Miracles. It's a large two-volume set. And he looks at miracles from a philosophical, from, the, from a biblical, from an ancient and a contemporary perspective. He documents the abundance of contemporary miracles throughout the world today. We imagine miracles impact people's beliefs in different ways from how they actually do. 
This is attested to in books, and it's very much my experience. I've seen many people who at one point in their lives would testify to have at least believed in a particular miracle. Maybe it's even they've even participated in it at one level or another, and then later on in their life just don't really quite know how to integrate it into the rest of their map. And, and this is consistent with what we see in the Bible among the disciples. If you read the Gospels, the disciples are, are, are eyewitness to innumerable miracles, yet, well, when the chips are down and Jesus is arrested, all of their memory of those miracles notwithstanding, they flee. And at least until the day of, Hen of Pentecost, they're really a rather hapless bunch. And I think this shows that miracles don't exactly do often what we, especially in a secular, secular world, think they should do. We imagine something much more direct, which is generally how we think of people. Often people will say, say to me, Pastor, you should, you should tell people to stop doing this and start doing that. And, well, what's amazing to me is that sometimes if I'm feeling particularly trollish, I might turn it around on them and, in fact, tell them to stop doing something or start doing another thing, and it has precisely no effect. And I'll point that out and say, what makes you think it will have more effect on other people? We do not work directly in the way that we imagine. People, upon witnessing something miraculous or perhaps hearing a story from a source that is credible to them, will express a whole bunch of things and they'll have a momentary openness and a variety of perspectives. But for the most part, they go back to who they were and what they were doing. Our formation is much more enduring and settled than what just one miracle will necessarily open us up to. Now again, that isn't always the case either. For some, for some people, one miracle drastically changes their life. In many respects, a drastic change in life is miracle enough for many people, but this is kind of the way we are. We see miracles, um, believe in the miracles, and then the daily thoughts, commitments, practices that make up most of our lives sort of brings us back to where we were before. The reality of our lives is far more complex. Formation happens with many more forming factors that shape our decisions, our values, our actions. In fact, the history of miracles in the Christian church in and of itself has been rather interesting. In the Protestant Reformation, um, Protestants in particular were highly skeptical of many Catholic miracles, but that doesn't mean that Protestants themselves were skeptical of miracles that they found in the Bible. And of course, today, especially with the Pentecostal movement and the charismatic movements, um, most Christians today aren't secessionists that believe that somehow miracles ceased in the first century and aren't there today. The relationship between the church and the miraculous is very complex. You have a tradition of openness to the power of God to disrupt the expected, uh, remain to the expected. That tradition remains, but there's also a burden to maintain credibility by understanding and acknowledging acknowledging the reality of myth, legend, and charlatanism, and this is preserved. And we see this also in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, some of the changes that were brought on by the Protestant Reformation, transformation within the Catholic Church itself, brought about a much more rigorous standard and examination before a miracle could be accepted by the broader church overall. The Protestant Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution have impacted the church and the culture in many ways. That in and of itself is a very big story that I don't have anywhere near time to go into right now, but I thought it's important to mention because it's important. It's an important part of the history that in some ways divides us from, from Luke and his writing of his day. Yet ongoing credible testimony of miracles endures and is common. I know people and have heard miracle stories that I have absolutely no reason to disbelieve. Um, I know the people, they are credible, they are sane, they are truthful, they are judicious, they don't run with all kinds of miracle stories. I know people who come to me with all sorts of miracle stories and I'm far more skeptical with them, but with those that I know and trust, I have absolutely no question about the reality of miracles in the world today. 
Confusions and doubt, confusion and doubts, although, continue, and contemporary exploration, enlightened by biblical teaching, I think remains an important, necessary thing. This is something that the church has to keep uh, talking about and struggling with, and in many ways, miracles are difficult on us. Maintaining an openness to the miraculous is costly for many of us. It invites both hope and disappointment. How often don't we pray fervently for someone who, who would certainly, um, a, a situation would certainly deserve miraculous intervention from God and it doesn't come. And then we hear through another story, a miracle from a very credible source and we think, Lord, why them and not them? It's this agency of God, this freedom of God, which which troubles us because it's in those moments that we very quickly have to remember that God is God and we are not. And our position with respect to him means we're called to trust and obey and we don't call the shots. Why does God seem to act in that case and not in this other that seems so clear and necessary? It disturbs our, um, our meritocratic and democratic assumptions. Now, I want to sort of land the plane on this sermon by reading a story that isn't about a sermon, because in many ways, miracles interrupt sort of the set assumptions of karmic religion that are pervasive. Not only in, you can find them very clearly in the Old Testament, even though they're, they're critiqued quite strongly in the Old Testament in the book of Job. But when you look at the dis-ease by which we, we carry our belief in miracles, a lot of it has to do with our assumptions of sort of a, a karmic approach to Christianity, that our moral performance, that our fidelity to belief— that all of the things that we muster somehow ought to purchase from God the privilege of him serving miracles to us at a higher rate than he would serve out to, let's say, the undeserving. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus started on his way and a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's life of the age to come. That's a very broad and expansive idea. Jesus, what might, what must I do so that God's kingdom would fall upon me, so that I would live in the age to come, so that I would live on earth as it is in heaven? What must I do so that I can achieve all of those things that are far beyond even the good that I can imagine? Give me the formula and I will do it. Okay, and then you will achieve for yourself the salvation that you wisely hunger for. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. That's a question that we usually sort of just run over the top of. Why do you call me good? Job, of course, this was a very big deal. Job was, in some ways, as the book of Job characterizes him, the best man in the world, the most faithful, the most scrupulous, the most obedient, the most generous, the most open-handed. Job was the epitome of a good man. Why do you think Jesus is good? A lot of people didn't think he was. No one is good except God alone. So is Jesus good and why? You know the commandments. Come on, young man, this is Sunday school stuff. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, you will honor your father and your mother. You know all these things. Why are you asking me a question like this? It's in the book. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Oh, so you've done this all and you haven't received? either the karmic reward or the miraculous dispensation that your meritorious actions have bestowed upon you, there must be something missing. God's kingdom hasn't fully come in my life. Where are the miracles, Jesus? You're doing them. Why not for me? 
Jesus looked at him and loved him. In other words, this is not a hypocrite. This is not someone who is playing a game with Jesus. This man is sincere. He has, in his life, strived to do the good. He has strived to keep the covenant and obey God's commandments. He has done well. Jesus loved him. One thing you lack. Oh, that's exactly what he's exactly what he's been waiting for. There must be a key. There must be there must be some special thing, some extraordinary mountain I must climb in order to receive the miracle, the just reward, the special dispensation to have all of my prayers answered. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come top, come come follow me. Simple, clear, applicable. It's all there. It's all right there. Do it. Do it. At this the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, that shouldn't surprise anyone who understands the karmic answer of the covenant. Read the book of Deuteronomy. If you obey the commandments, you will be blessed. And part of that blessing is wealth. And everything will be fine. Your children will flourish. Your wives will flourish. Your animals will flourish. Everything will go well for you. And he's been scrupulous and he's done everything. And now Jesus asks him to take all of God's blessings to him and renounce them and give them up. Magic is about securing health and wealth, and there's a little bit of magic underneath this question to Jesus. magic religion is about working the long game of God's favor. Through obedience, God will bless you. This is the test of the book of Job. Jesus challenged this man on what game he was playing. What really do you want? Do you want the fruit of God's favor? or his favor with suffering. Now, many people have noted that one way to categorize religions very broadly are sort of nature religions, which are religions of abundance, which are how we can receive in this lifetime. And in the ancient world, that was very direct. How can our flocks produce? How can our how can our fields produce? And just read the blessings in Deuteronomy. They're all there. And then renunciation religions, which are often sort of come out of the East, where one renounces flocks and herds and wives and children and all of those things and, and, and lives on as, as little as possible and sort of loves, loves God in the absence of all of those things. Israel religion was sort of like a strange nature religion with a very big God who totally owns the world. You have Deuteronomy, blessings and curses. Jesus, is he dabbling in renunciation religion? Turn from the world and you will receive what? Heavenly visions, mystical blessings, all of these things that are immaterial, upper register. Is that what Jesus is offering? Well, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, and we don't pay anywhere near attention to that amazement. The disciples know their catechism. Do good and you will be blessed. Do evil and you will be punished. Keep the covenant and you will be blessed. Break the covenant and you will be punished. It's all in Deuteronomy. And now Jesus sort of looks at the people who have all of the evidence of God's favor, miraculous or the slow miracles of health and wealth, and turns it on its head. The disciples are amazed. But Jesus again said, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Is that renunciation religion? Is that what Jesus is saying and doing? The disciples were even more amazed. He's turning Deuteronomy on its head. 
And then they said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus doesn't simply switch, however, to skeptical religion of renunciation, to, to dust in the wind or sound and fury signifying nothing. And Jesus looks at them and says, with man this is impossible, but not with God. You can't prime the pump for miracles. They are gifts. With God, all things are possible. In fact, this rescue from God is a gift. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Oh, now he's on board with renunciation religion. Before they were wondering, well, how, how, how can we be at the front of the line when, when the nature religion finally starts to pay off as we're paying our dues right now? Now it's renunciation. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brother or sister or father or mother or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. Huh? I thought the choice was nature religion or renunciation religion. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Huh? Jesus, what do you mean? What does Jesus get for all of Jesus' obedience? He should have wives and children and houses and flocks and all of the stuff that Job had both before and after his restoration. That's how karmic religion is supposed to work. Does Jesus receive homes, family, children, fields? Even Job is restored. Why didn't Jesus turn stones into bread? Or make a show of angelic intervention for the temple crowds to watch? What is Jesus doing? Where is the miraculous? Jesus does miracles for the welfare of others, but still they will die. Jesus himself suffers, and Jesus is raised from the dead. One commentator notes that nowhere else are so many miracles reported of a single person as they are in the Gospels of Jesus. This miracle story of Paul is amazing. But what does Ananias what is Ananias told? I will show him how much he must suffer. This Christianity is a strange religion. We would expect a, a nature religion where doing good gets us blessed. Or a renunciation religion where it's, it's nothing but, but as few calories as possible out in the desert in pursuit of, of visions of angels and ecstasies of the mystical sort. Jesus holds those two things and says, yeah, there's that. But it all comes from God. It's all his gift. You don't jig it. You don't rig it. You don't earn it. You don't trick others. You don't trick God. Jesus' miracles are unique. The uniqueness of the miracles of the historical Jesus lies in the fact that healings and exorcisms which take place in the present are accorded an eschatological significance. The now and not yet are tied when the miracle comes. We are, we are connected with our future and a window is open just for a moment that says, chase this. Look here. Don't chase the miracle. Chase where the miracle is pointing. And that path involves suffering. Nowhere else do we find a charismatic miracle worker whose miraculous deeds are meant to be the end of an old world and the beginning of a new. Miracles enliven our imagination to be open to God's power and presence. That's what they do. They get our attention but they're samples of heaven. They're not the food that we must rely on from God day in and day out. They don't necessarily afford faith. They always come from God and they manifest his will, 
even if we can't figure it out. Not magic, which is our power and will and manipulation. Jesus' miracles, even though his disciples, even through his disciples, were first fruits of the age to come, gifts and signs of his grace and his presence among them. And in Ephesus, they were part of God's mission. But he sends them when we when he wants us to have them, and he doesn't at other times. But they are of him. They are his gifts of grace. We can eagerly pray for them. We can ask God for them. But he will give us what we want, and most of all, what we need, according to his pleasure and for his glory. Amen.